Right. Okay. Well, um, welcome to the Rames Society's November lecture. Gives me enormous pleasure. I'm Catherine Edwards, president of the Rames Society. Gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Professor Eleanor Dickey, who's our speaker for this evening. Um, Eleanor Dickey's a, a lecturer to the, um, the, the British Academy in 2014, a fellow of the Academia Europaea, the European Union's equivalent. Um, long may it flourish. Um, after a DPhil at Oxford, uh, she's taught in, at the University of Ottawa in Canada and at um, Columbia, um, at also, also at Exeter, before coming to Reading uh, in 2013, where she currently is. Uh, Eleanor is, is the world expert on um, language in uh, um, language development in antiquity. She's the author of several acclaimed books, um, 1996 Greek Forms of Address, 2002 Latin Forms of Address from Plautus to Apuleius, um, 2007 Ancient Greek Scholarship, and something which I hope we're going to be hearing about, I'm pretty certain we're going to be hearing about this evening, is um, her 2016 volume Learning Latin the Ancient Way, which has garnered enormous press coverage. It's been a, a, a kind of amazing hit. Um, long articles in The Guardian. Uh, so this is very exciting work, and we're delighted that Eleanor's going to be sharing it with us this evening. Um, Eleanor's also um, a, a pillar of the community in her uh, work on um, supporting early career researchers as well. So it's an, another aspect to her, her, her role at Reading and in, in, um, in the world of classics generally. So over to you, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you. So suppose someone who doesn't know any Italian is going to go to Rome today, they might pick up something like this. And inside it, they might find different sections with little headings um, containing phrases um, in narrow columns with a sort of line for line translation in the two different languages and containing alternatives so that you can use different variations of the phrase according to who you are talking to. And that's not just for Italian, that's a standard thing, the phrase book. Well, actually, things were not that different in antiquity. If you were going to Rome and you did not know the language, you might pick yourself up a papyrus roll phrase book, looking like this. And it would have headings telling you what it was talking about. And it would have little phrases in narrow columns with a bilingual translation. OK, that one I've added, but those two are in the original. And it would have equivalents, egote, no suos, that you could adjust your phrases according to who you were talking to. Now, you may think that that's just one coincidental overlap. The modern phrase book has lots of sections. It's not just the conversation section. It's got a hotel section, a restaurant section, an airport section. So does the ancient phrase book have lots of sections. But they are not quite the same sections. For example, that is the excuses section, something often missing from a modern phrase book, but highly useful. Now, this one hasn't got a heading, but it has something else that does the same job. It's got a little dialogue, which sets the scene for a circumstance in which you're going to need an excuse. And it's a particular kind of an excuse. It's an excuse for not doing something. And here, I think we see something that is crucial about the ancient phrase books. Um, they teach culture as well as language, and they teach a culture that is different. I have been teaching for more than two decades. And when you teach, you must be an expert. Not necessarily on the subject that you teach, that's optional, but on <laughs> excuses. You will be an expert on excuses, particular excuses for not doing things, which is exactly what we've got. And yet there is stuff here I've never had. I cannot do my Latin homework. I'm going to take a bath. Sorry, I've never had that one. <laughs> Two decades of teaching. It just, you don't get it these days. Here is something else that we don't often get in a modern phrase book. It is the insult section. This is not the whole insult section. This is a small selection of extract from the insult section. Now, some of these are things that we might recognize. And some of them are, again, very, very different. This is a slave-based insult system because 
the Roman social hierarchy is very stratified, and there are several layers at the bottom that are slaves. So for example, here is some more. We're still not all the way through the insult sections. This is another selection of insult from the insult section. And we know these are all insults because they are in the insults section. And some of them don't look obviously like insults. But we know they are. And that tells us that this is not designed to be spoken to a slave or a freedman. This is designed to be spoken to a freeborn citizen. And in that case, it's absolutely crushing because the assumption behind it is that it's obvious from looking at you that you must be either a slave or a freedman. You are clearly not a freeborn citizen. That's why it is insulting. So you can learn a lot about the way the insult system, where the culture works by looking at these things. But it also tells us something else. I mean, why is it that you have a great big healthy insult section in an ancient phrase book, and this thing hasn't got an insult section at all? Is that because we are so much more polite than the ancient Romans were? No, I don't think that's it. I think it has to do with what this fundamental is. This is a reference work. If you're actually studying Italian, this is not the book that you take to Rome. This is for people who aren't studying Italian and who are hoping they won't have to use it. This is the book that you take with you if you hope they're all going to speak English. <laughs> but if you find yourself in the hotel lobby and you discover that they positively don't speak any English and you need to book a double room for two nights, then you haul it out and you leaf through it. That's why it's got color-coded pages. You find the right section. You scroll down to the right bit, and you try to pronounce the Italian for I'd like a double bed for two nights. And if that doesn't work, then you point to the right face, and you pass it to the receptionist, and you look imploring. Now, that might work because the hotel wants your business. The receptionist is going to try to cooperate with communication. But now, imagine that this is the kind of thing you want to say to that receptionist. And you're holding out your papyrus roll phrase book. This is hopeless. The receptionist is not going to communicate, trying to cooperate with that kind of communication. By the time you've found the insult section and identified the right insult, um, the other person, if you're lucky, has walked away. And if you're not lucky, has done something else. And they're certainly not going to read it off if you pass it to them and point. So. What this tells us is that although the ancient phrase book looks in many ways very much like a modern one, it's not designed to be used the same way. These are not actually reference works because that material doesn't make any sense in a reference work. This is material that you have to learn before the moment when you use it. At the moment when you want to use it, it's too late to look it up. So these are actually teaching materials. Even though they resemble our phrase books much more than our teaching materials, what they are is teaching materials. <coughs> and in fact, many of them are connected scenes rather than phrases. So here's another extract from the same text. And this one is not phrases, but a continuous text. And it's a text about a child who goes <coughs> to school and learns a language. And this is really common. A lot of these ancient language learning texts describe a child learning a language, which is unbelievably convenient for us if we want to know how they learned languages. We've got this description. So we've got here, for example, a boy who comes to school and he says he wants to work hard, teach me to speak Latin, not to read Latin, not to write Latin, to speak Latin. The teacher doesn't say yes. The teacher doesn't say, well, my tuition fees are such and such. There will be tuition fees. But that's not what the teacher discusses. He discusses whether the child is going to pay attention. He gets the kid's agreement to cooperate. And then he applies positive reinforcement. And then he starts the lesson. So what are these texts that I'm talking about? They are called the Colloquia of the Hermeneumata Pseudo Dosithiana. It took me about six months of hard work to learn how to pronounce <laughs> Hermeneumata Pseudo Dosithiana, but I could not do it really solidly. 
Um, so colloquia is a fancy name for a set of bilingual narratives, dialogues, and phrase books. Um, and there are basically six of them, and they are found in this larger body of text called the Hermeneumata Pseudo-Docetheana. And Hermeneumata is these bilingual texts in narrow columns, whatever they are, if they are continuous text, if they are phrase books, or if they are glossaries. And actually, most of the Hermeneumata are glossaries. Um, but there also are other, a bunch of texts, including the colloquia, which are different from other texts because they were written deliberately in a bilingual format as language teaching aids. Then we have other texts which are put into a bilingual format and adapted to be language teaching aids, which you also find in the Hermeneutica. <laughs> and you find these both in papyri, so ancient copies, and in medieval manuscripts, only Western manuscripts, never Eastern manuscripts. Um, and when they're in the manuscripts, a few of them are attached to the bilingual Latin grammar of Dositheus, which is how, when they were first discovered, they became the Hermeneumata Dositheana. And then it was noticed they actually had nothing to do with the grammar, and they're much older, and then they became the Hermeneumata Pseudo Dositheana. And like I said, there are six of them, more or less, and they're named after the manuscripts in which they are found. That's why they have those long and complicated names. Well, here is one of the nicest ones, the Colloquium Hermeneum. <coughs> That's the one I've been talking about so far. And it has one really nice manuscript, which is actually right here in London, in the British Library. Um, and you can see it's in those narrow columns. Um, there's a close-up. You can see that here is the Latin over on the right. And if you can read that script, you can see that the Latin is more or less okay. That is readable. Over here on the left, you have the Greek. Um, and the Greek is not feeling very well. Um, and that is, I'm afraid, fairly typical for the bilingual text transmitted in the West. The Greek has had a very hard time. Um, no doubt if they'd been transmitted in the East, it would be the Latin that had had a hard time, but they haven't survived in the Eastern tradition. They've only survived in the Western tradition. Now, one of the things that's nice about this manuscript in London, apart from the fact that it's actually there, you can see it, and the British Library has put really, really nice digital photographs freely available online so you can see it without going to the British Library as well. But there is also a papyrus of it, um, of the same text. Now, okay, it's not the world's biggest, most complete papyrus. It has several fragments, and this is the really big one. <laughs> However, it is a papyrus. And you can see some features of it. It's got here the Greek on the right and the Latin on the left. And that's because the way these texts work is that you put the language you're learning first and the one you already know second. So the papyrus comes from Egypt in antiquity. People in Egypt in antiquity mostly knew Greek already. And if they're learning something, it's Latin. Whereas a manuscript copied around 900 in the West these are people who already know Latin, and they are learning Greek. So they've reversed the columns. Um, the idea that it's in narrow columns, however, is the same, and the actual line divisions are the same. So those line divisions go back to antiquity. Here's what that passage says. What I've done is that's the piece of the manuscript that I showed you. And where I've put it in bold, that's a word that survives on the papyrus. Now, obviously, some of the words that don't survive on the papyrus were there once upon a time and just aren't anymore. Um, but some of them clearly weren't. So, for example, quae um, fecisti wasn't there. Qui tibi dixit was there but isn't, isn't anymore. Um, so you can see that it isn't quite the same text. But it's close enough that you can see um, it was a variant of the same text. And here we have our little child again. Um, but this time, um, he's not at school. He should be at school, but he isn't. And he has got himself in trouble. And of course, what happens when you get in trouble as a child in antiquity? You get whipped. So the reader is going to be expecting that the next thing that happens is this kid gets a whipping. 
It never happens in the colloquy. You never have a child being whipped. And I think that is quite interesting. The teachers are trying to be positive. They're writing these things because they want to encourage the students to stick with their studies and keep with the reading. And describing whipping is maybe not as effective as what they do, which is describing a story in which the child gets off because he has a really good excuse. His father took him to town on important business involving letters from the emperor. This kid's father is really important. Teachers are not important. So the child has just pulled rank on the teacher by mentioning those letters from the emperor. And it's enormously effective. Um, the teacher is silenced. The child is not punished. And this is not a like recording of something that happened in an ancient classroom. This is an artistic construction produced by an ancient teacher who's describing the humiliation of an ancient teacher because he knows that this will, is what will keep the child reading. So although linguistically, stylistically, these things are very, very simple, um, they're not naive. They're often very, very clever in terms of the content. Now, I have actually made a copy of the Colloquium Harleanum, and this is it. Um, what I've done is I've taken the text that's in the manuscript, because as you can see, the text that's in the papyrus wouldn't be very long. But I've used the script and the layout from the papyrus to try to give you an idea of what it actually would have looked like in antiquity. So I'm going to pass this around. You could just be careful. It took me four days to make. Um, so if you could pass it back this way and then up this side so that it ends back here. Thank you. So the Cloquem Harleanum is only one of a whole set of texts, as I said. Um, this is another one, the Colloquium Stefani. And we don't have a manuscript for the Colloquium Stefani. We have a 16th century printed book. Um, so it is kind of large. There's a close-up of the place right at the top left of this photograph is where the Colloquium Stefani begins. It is based on a manuscript, and indeed in the preface, um, the publisher tells us about the manuscript. Um, it's, it does have Greek. The, Greek. the Greek does make sense if you can read 16th century um, book font, but of course it doesn't look much like um, we would print Greek today. There is um, that text in a more um, modern friendly format. We see once again we're at the beginning of the day. Um, so boy gets up in the morning, and this is a very good little boy. This is an exemplum of what a boy should be. And you might think about you know Roman exemplar. What is a a perfect Roman Roman virtue? Well, Roman virtue involves normally getting tortured or being killed in brave defense of your homeland against the evil enemy. But that's adult Roman virtue. We're talking the virtue of a small child here. What is the virtue of a small child? Um, actually, he's clean. That's, that's the real virtue of a small child. So he gets up. He puts on his shoes and his leggings because it is cold. And then um, he washes. He washes his hands. He washes his face. He took a bath yesterday afternoon, so he doesn't need to wash anything more. Um, he brushes his teeth. He remembers to spit rather than swallow it. He blows his nose. He dries himself off nicely because that's the way you should go to school. And then he gets his school things gathered up. He doesn't have to carry them himself. He's got a slave boy for that. But he hands them to his slave boy, and he goes off. He's only omitted one thing. He's not dressed apart from those shoes and socks. Hence the title of my talk. Um, so he has gone off to school with a little omission. I'm sure this is not the way the author intended this text to go. Um, things have happened to these texts in transmission. So good little child on his way to school, he says hello to all his acquaintances. Um, and then when he comes to the staircase, he does not run. He goes up one step at a time. You can hear the pedagogue in the background say, don't run, dear. You might trip and fall. 
And then when he gets to the school vestibule, he remembers to take off his coat. He doesn't go barging in. He takes off his coat and he combs his hair. And then he goes in and he says hello to the teacher and everybody else. This is one of the aspects of ancient education that seems weirdest to us. There is no set start time for the school day. So people just get there when they get there. And the earlier they get there, the better, because the more education they get. Um, but you arrive when you arrive. And um, when you arrive, there's other people there already who got there before you who are already working. And you interrupt them. You barge in, and you say to the teacher, hello, teacher. And he stops what he's doing, and he says hello back to you. And then you say to all the students, hello. And they stop what they're doing and go back to you. Um, personally, I wouldn't be able to stand this as a teacher. However, um, it is absolutely what they do. Because we get dialogue after dialogue where this is being taught. This is what the good child does when he gets to school. And of course, he does some actual work as well. So here is a dictation exercise from Demosthenes. Now, that's awfully impressive. Um, though the teacher hastily points out that it's not like an entire speech of Demosthenes, which might be a like two-week dictation project, um, but you know, as much as there was time for, probably a small paragraph. Um, but he he's good. He puts in the punctuation. That's the really hard bit. He gets that right. He takes the book and he writes out everyday conversation. Everyday conversation is probably these bilingual everyday conversations. Um, and he's copying them. He's making his own copy of the book. That's a good way for children to acquire their own copy of the book. In the first place, you otherwise would have to pay somebody else to copy the book. And that, that's wasting um, a fair amount of money or wasting the time of one of your highly trained slaves. But in the second place, it's good for the child. It's part of his education to copy out his textbook, make his own copy. And that helps him when he starts to read it. It also means that a lot of the copies that we have of educational materials are terrible because they were made by people who didn't fully understand them. Then he does his reading. It gets explained. The teacher explains the characters. What that means is the teacher explains who's talking. Because with a dramatic text in antiquity, you don't get speaker attributions. So one of the main things that a reader needs to do is to work out who says what. And then he does some reading on scene. That's really good for a child to manage. That's what's really hard. Normally, at school, to do a reading, you have to sit down and prepare it and work it out. So this, this child is, this is our exemplary child. He's very good. Here's another one. Um, this one is in Leiden. There is just one surviving manuscript of it, and it's really pretty old, and it's very nice. Um, here is a blow-up of it, and you've got a scene where a boy at school says, Kondiskipoli, locum mihi date meum. So, what is he saying? He wants his seat. He got to school, and somebody is in his seat. Because, of course, since there is no set start time, people may get there before you. And then we have a bunch of alternative vocabulary items for seat that you might want to know. And he tells the others to squash themselves together. But the guy in his seat stands firm. This is my spot. I got it first. You could hear that at a primary school today. Here's another one. Um, this is another one of my favorites. It's in Zwettel Abbey in Austria. It's also in a lot of other places. Um, that previous one, there's only one surviving manuscript. But this one, there's a whole bunch, about a dozen. Um, and most of them are from the 12th century. Um, some of them are later, but none of them are earlier. And as you might expect by it being a bit later, it has had more problems. In fact, it's had some quite serious problems. Can anybody tell me where the Greek is in this? <laughs> anybody see any Greek? 
transliterated. It's transliterated. So yeah, so this column is Greek, and this column is Greek. Um, you can work that out by the fact that this one and this one look as though they're Latin. Um, the Greek has been transliterated, the transliterated, and then it's had a very tough time after being transliterated. It's really, it's really tough, this Greek. Um, fortunately, there are a few manuscripts related to this one where the Greek survived, um, but they are much later, so they have other problems. Um, and therefore, this is actually the best manuscript of this particular um, branch. And this one's got fights, too, about who recited first. You're lying. I'm not lying. Again, you could hear this in any <laughs> primary school today. And this one gives us some really valuable information about what you did with these texts. Because think about it. It's odd, from our perspective, they're being given a bilingual text for language learning. There are lots of ways that different people teach Latin. But I don't know anybody who teaches it by giving people a translation as well as the Latin. Because then what would you do? I mean, if I give my students a Latin text, what I'm asking them to do is to translate it. I want them to read it, I want them to understand it, and I want them to demonstrate they've understood the Latin by translating it. And how could I do that if I gave them a translation? At that point, there is nothing they can do to show me they've understood. But it just is the case that in antiquity, people were given um, a running translation. And this tells us what they did. So we've got another one of these boys who gets to school, starts off by interrupting everybody and greeting the teacher. And he's got his personal slave boy. They, they like to have a personal slave boy. It's probably a good way to get the slave boy educated. And a list of what he's brought to school his writing tablets, his styluses, and a thing that I think is a ruler, but not everybody agrees with me. And what does he do first? He erases his tablet um, because it's still got all the writing from yesterday, and then he writes. And I actually brought you a re reproduction tablet so you can see how this works. So feel free to write on it. Feel free to erase it. Don't press too hard when you write, because if you press too hard, it's really, really hard for people behind you to erase. I can erase it, I'll do it with an iron, but um, <laughs> it will be easier for other people if you don't press too hard. So you write like this, you erase with this end, and you need to hold it like this and pull it across at this kind of angle. If you do this with it, you'll gouge the wax out, and then it will be really tough to sort out even with the iron. So um, that's what he's, what he's doing. Um, and then he does his reading, he passes the book on, and then the last three lines are the bit we're really interested in. Um, I learned thoroughly the hermeneumata. Now we know that hermeneumata is the word for these bilingual texts, and I produce them. Now produce is my translation of a technical term that we don't really have the equivalent of. So redo, apodidomi, is a technical term for handing in your assignment in whatever form the assignment should be handed in. So supposing your assignment is to write something on the tablet, well, when you hand that tablet to the teacher, you've handed in your assignment, that's redo. Suppose your assignment is to do a reading. You prepare your reading. You work out who's talking. You work out how to pronounce everything. You work out where the punctuation goes. You go up and you read your reading. That is redo. <coughs> Suppose your assignment is to memorize something. You sit there and you repeat it until you know it by heart. Then you go up and you recite it from memory in order to <coughs> demonstrate that you know it by heart. That's redo. So what they're doing in that last line with redidi depends on what they've done earlier. What they've done earlier is edisco ekmanthano. He's memorized it. <coughs> so what you did with these texts was you memorized them and then you recited them. It doesn't say what you memorized, but I'm pretty sure that what you memorized was the bit in the language that you were learning. So if you are a Greek speaker and you're learning Latin, you memorize the Latin. And if you're a Latin speaker learning Greek, you memorize the Greek. And that, of course, starts to be quite similar to things that we would do in a language class. So when I was learning French, I had to memorize little dialogues about going to a cafe in Paris. And you order a sandwich, what you say, what the waiter says. Um, 
everybody memorizes it, and then the children stand up in pairs, and they perform this dialogue. And the idea is that if you do enough of these, when you end up in Paris and you want a sandwich, you can conduct the appropriate conversation in the cafe, provided, of course, and it's a big provided, that the waiter says exactly <laughs> what it says in your book. Now, don't laugh. It once happened to me. I have learned many languages. And once it, I actually got somebody who had exactly the conversation that was in my Teach Yourself Welsh book with me. It was verbatim the same. And to this day, he thinks I know Welsh. So it can work. Um, but we, of course, were not given a translation, not in the French class, not in the Welsh class. And usually that was OK, because we were given relatively simple texts. And I knew what it said in French. I knew what it said in Welsh. But in my Hebrew class, I was given totally impossible texts. I had no idea what they meant. And I memorized them, and I recited them. And I know them, some of them to this day. But I still don't know what they mean. <laughs> I submit that actually my Hebrew class would have worked much better as a means of teaching me Hebrew um, had we had this system with a running translation. We were given a translation. It's not that we weren't given a translation. But a translation is useless if you cannot actually work out how it matches the original text. And this system is perfect for that, because it's a line-for-line -line translation. There is, fundamentally, what this does is take a text and turn it into a glossary. So if you want to use this as a glossary, you have an exact translation of every word that's on the left and the same line on the right. Some of them are words, some of them are phrases. The syntax and the word order doesn't have to match within a line, but it's absolutely going to match between lines. And that means that you can always work out which bit of this column applies to which bit of that column. It's actually a really good system in many ways. And the ancient room in which it's being used is what we'd call a one-room schoolhouse. You have multiple people doing different things. So in this description, you've got three groups. You have the little ones who are just learning how to read. Now in antiquity, you don't learn to read by first learning the alphabet and then moving on to words. So C, A, and T, you've got those letters, now you can do cat. No, you cannot do cat until you have had weeks and weeks of doing syllables. Quintilian is very specific on this point. Your reading ability will be damaged forever if you move on too quickly to whole words. So after you've got the alphabet, you do ba, ba, bi, bo, boo, ga, ga, gi, go, gu, etc., until you are really good at your syllables. And so these children are doing that, and they're being taught by one of the bigger pupils. So either he is writing down syllables for them and they're reading them off, or he is saying syllables and they're writing them down. And then we've got a middle group, and they are working with a teaching assistant. They are writing their names, and they are writing verses. So if it's Greek, they're writing Homer. If it's Latin, they're writing Virgil. Writing your name is very important in antiquity as it is today, but today we tend to think it's kind of the beginning. You know, the child learns to write his name. That's wonderful. Now he's going to go on to something bigger. Actually, in antiquity, sometimes that's all you do, because being literate means being able to sign your name. That means that if somebody gives you a document, you can sign it. You can't read it, which is really not necessarily a good idea to be able to sign it if you can't read it. But it, it, you are considered literate if you can um, sign that document. And then the narrator is in the top class, and he has an exercise, and we don't actually know quite what his exercise is. Now, I focused a lot on the school scenes, because they tell us how you learned a language. But that's only about half the text that we have in these school books. The other half concerns adults, and some of that also tells us how you learn a language, but in a more indirect way. So in the East, not everybody learns Latin. You only learn Latin if you have a reason to learn Latin. And one of the big reasons why people learn Latin is because they want to be lawyers. Roman law relies very heavily on Latin. So the will of a Roman citizen is supposed to be in Latin. A real lawyer needs to be able to draw up a will, and that means he needs to be able to do it in Latin. Now, it's true that nobody may ever read the Latin version. Um, they may all refer to the Greek version that is attached. But never mind, it's not official without that Latin version. So 
a lot of the people who are using these texts in the East are law students, and they need to be encouraged to keep up their studies by being reminded of how good their lives will be once they graduate. So this is a banking scene. We're going to the bank. What are we getting money for? We're getting money for the lawyers, because lawyers are well paid. So just injecting into this scene that you need to pay lawyers well. And here is, a bit later on in the same scene, what those lawyers are doing for 100 denarii. That is the court case. That's the whole thing. So the lawyers say practically nothing. It's completely inane. Um, they have no objections to answer, because when their opponent tries to get a word in edgewise, they just tell him to shut up. <laughs> and then, at the end, the verdict is declared, and they have won. And that is the way law is in the colloquia. You always win your case. You're always well paid. There's never much opposition on the other side. <laughs> and this is what happens if you need a job. So here we have two people who run into each other. One of them is a lawyer, and the other one says to him, um, what are you doing? And he says, I am at leisure. In other words, I'm unemployed. I've not got any work. And immediately his friend says, oh, let me give you a job. I want to hand over my court case. I'll give you something to do right away. Why? Is it because I really need a lawyer because I've got this really tough court case? Is it because I know you're a really good lawyer? No, none of those. It's because you are worthy of all good things. You have done your work. You have qualified as a lawyer. You learned that Latin. And therefore, if you ever need a job, the first person you meet will give you one. This is the message that is being sent. Now, I am sure we would never do anything like that today. Here is um, another one. This one is quite special in that it's only been discovered quite recently. And I'm really honored to have in this room the person who did discover it, which is Carlotta Dionisotti. Um, and this one, you will observe, looks different from the others. It is not in narrow columns. And that's because this is a really late copy um, by somebody who has taken the narrow columns out. And what he's done is he's used red ink for the Greek and black ink for the Latin and tried to make it line up as an interlinear translation. Um, he's not totally succeeded sometimes. I mean, the Greek, generally speaking, takes a bit more space than the Latin. So it hasn't worked completely well. But that's what he's trying to do. And if you look more closely, you can see these random capital letters. And the capital letters don't necessarily come at the beginning of sentences. They don't necessarily come with people's names. Where they come is where the lines began, back when it was a two-column text. Because in the medieval manuscripts, especially those 12th century ones, the first letter of each line is capitalized. And that's particularly noticeable in the Latin, because the Greek is often all in capitals anyway. Um, but you capitalize the beginning of each line, and those capitals stay in the manuscript, showing that this text originally was two column as well. And at the moment, this seems to be the most famous passage in the colloquia, um, because when um, these texts sort of became two days of media sensation back in February, this was the one that everybody decided to focus on. So somebody comes home a bit the worse for wear and gets greeted by somebody who's pretty cross. I think she's his wife, but I don't actually know. Um, it could be. It's not a father, because um, domine is just not, not the way you would address, um, your, fa address your son. It, and it seems to me unlikely that it's a son talking to his father, but it could be a brother. Um, I think it's probably a wife, in any case. She says, who acts like this, sir, as you do, that you drink so much? What will people say who saw you in such a condition, that you never dined out so greedily? Is this a fitting way for a prudent paterfamilias who minds his own business to conduct himself? It's not possible for things to happen more shamefully or more <laughs> ignominiously than you acted yesterday. 
and he has not got much to say for himself. I certainly am very much ashamed <laughs> about what he can come up with. And she goes on, what do others say in your absence? You've accumulated great infamy for yourself. In addition to this, great censure has occurred as a result of such intemperance. Please, in the future, don't do such a thing. But now do you want to vomit? And I'm amazed what has become of you. And he, he cannot defend himself. I do not know what to say, for I have been so upset that I can't give an explanation to anyone. That's the end of the scene. So this is probably an exemplum as well. We talked about the, the boy who is an example of the good student and the clean child. This is probably an example of what not to do. So if you go out and get drunk, then when you come back, A, you're going to get a terrible scolding, B, you're going to feel horrible, and C, you will be wholly unable to defend yourself. And the colloquium Celtis also tells us that you did a lot of grammar. Some people have thought from the fact that I dug up these bilingual texts that you sort of used an inductive method when you were learning languages in antiquity, and you did not have to learn your grammar. This is not true. You learned your grammar. Um, so the smaller ones are doing hermeneumata and syllables. So we know these are pretty small, because we've seen before that the syllable stage is very early on. And already at that stage, they are using these texts, the hermeneumata. And they're also conjugating their verbs. And they're doing the whole grammar book. That might be a slight exaggeration. Um, they're doing cases. They're doing genders. They're doing numbers. They're doing compositional status. They're doing inflections. They're doing lists of words in alphabetical order. They're doing letters of the alphabet, vowels, and continuants, and stop consonants. And then I ran out of space, or I would have made this slide too small to see, but it does go on. Um, they are described as doing grammar. I'm not convinced that the seven-year-olds actually do all of that grammar, but all of that grammar is clearly something that you um, would do in school. Now, here is one that is not preserved in a medieval manuscript. So with the others, if there's a papyrus, it overlaps with a manuscript. The manuscripts are where we really get a complete text. The papyri are wonderful for telling us about antiquity, but they're not so great for giving us an intact, continuous text. So this one, it's a little bit sad, because there was obviously quite a lot to it. And now all we have is this page. And as you can see, this page is not in, shall we say, mint condition. Um, another interesting thing about this page is that the Latin is in transliteration. So I realize it's not the most legible papyrus, so I've given you part of it um, in a more legible format. Can anybody tell me which column is the Latin? The left one. Can anybody read out what the Latin actually says? Yep, Mescio Quis does what? Yeah, hosti soon, but it clearly was supposed to be ostium. So, <laughs> ostium, and what does he do to the ostium? Pulsat, yes. Somebody's knocking on the door. Um, and then what happens? Exite. Exito, I think it's a, a third person imperative. Um, Quito, for us. At Disque Quiz ah, somebody go outside and find out who it is. <laughs> out quem pet it, or whom he's looking for. And what's the answer? About really or Wain it, yes. Yeah, so this is a late papyrus. So at this period, the Latin w sound has become a v sound. And the Greek b sound has also become a v sound. And therefore, um, you can write the Latin thing that we would write with a v can be written with a Greek beta. Unfortunately, the thing that we would write with a b can also be written with a Greek beta. With ab Aurelio Wainet, he's come from Aurelius. Any idea what it says then? Nuntium Tulit, he's brought our message. He, yes, call him here. 
Um, I, have, I know that this is not what you should say for here when it's motion towards. Um, this is not a, shall we say, mint prose composition exercise. This is vulgar Latin. Um, so call him here. Quidest tu Quidest What is it, boy? Yeah. It's, it doesn't say non tias, but it clearly should say non tias. Yes. It says um, nuitias, but it must really be non tias. Um, yes. Excellent. So this is really, it can be lots of fun when it's in transliteration and you have to kind of work out what it means. And finally, I'd like to go back to the colloquium Stefani um, to talk about what the implications are of the fact that he talks not only about the um, ideal child, what the ideal child would do, but also about the ideal classroom and the ideal teacher. Because when he's talking about the ideal child, you can imagine he's addressing his audience of pupils, telling them what the ideal child would do. But when he talks about the ideal classroom and the ideal teacher, he's probably addressing other teachers. And that tells us that he was writing for publication. It's not just an accident that we have the Colloquium Stefani. It's because somebody systematically wanted this used and distributed. And what is his educational philosophy? Well, he tells you that in the ideal classroom, everybody gets individually the education that is suitable for that individual, according to their ability, according to their progress, so how far along they are, according to how much time they've got, because not everybody spends the same amount of time per day in school. Um, you might have one child who arrives early in the morning and stays the whole day. You might have another child who gets up late and comes later, and then he's got gymnastics school or music school or something in the afternoon, so he's only there for a few hours according to how old they are, and, and this is my favorite, according to their different natures. Because some people have difficult dispositions when it comes to hard work. <laughs> and, he says, literary study is hard work. Even when you've done a lot, there is still a lot more to do. And that means that you, know, you need to take into account people's difficult dispositions. And I invite you to think what it would be like if we followed this teacher's philosophy and we gave people different amounts of work according to their disposition as regards hard work. And I'd also like to say that one can do something else with these texts, which is try to recreate the school environment that you think they're describing and see if it works. Um, and that is something that we do every year at Reading, and anybody who wants to come along is welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Eleanor, thank you so much for a completely fascinating talk. It's been wonderful to explore these different manuscripts and papyri, but also to kind of think about the whole process of teaching and learning in the ancient classroom. And it's so interesting to see some of the, the, the sort of um, it, the, the, the incidental details of, of, of uh, kind of daily life, um, and particularly the way in which the, the, the kind of language lessons reinforce social identity, so, you, so it's the kind of what language is appropriate to someone who's a, a puerum ingenuum, or ingenuitas also came up as well as, as a kind of key kind of point of reference. And, and I loved your bit at the beginning with kind of a, the, the selection of insults. And looking like a slave is obviously the worst possible thing that, that could befall you if you're a free Roman. Um, so uh, I'm sure others will have, have questions too, but they, they just obviously like to, yes. Um, I was very struck by the reference to dictation from Demosthenes and mm. writing out verses, which you obviously see with this Homer, it seems to me there's an enormous jump from the, this very basic, these very basic little dialogues to Demosthenes or Homer. Oh yes. I mean, it will be a bit like, say, expecting a year nine French class nowadays to have dictation from Montaigne or Voltaire or something. So I, I don't know. Ah, uh, this. Kind of the, well, on. what this is is a story of somebody who goes to school and he's more advanced than you, the reader. So you, the reader, are right at the beginning. You've seen the little ones are practicing hermeneutic.
But the narrator is in, not in the first class nor in the second class. The narrator is in the advanced class, so he's the guy doing the Demosthenes. So it's kind of the older pupil is telling you what the school experience is. Not quite yours. I mean, he, he sees yours. You're, you're the one in that first class that he's describing. But you're, you're going to get there where you're doing the Demosthenes. Absolutely, you are not reading these texts anymore by the time you're on Demosthenes. And probably the vast majority of them didn't make it to do dictation for Demosthenes. Yes. Would, would they actually be um, like a Dane school when the older kids help the younger ones? Or would it be? Um, they seem to be. I mean, it's quite clear that we have two different texts where it mentions an older, yeah. one of the older pupils teaching. Yeah the younger ones. Exactly how Daddy, who paid tuition, um, felt about this is not preserved. <laughs> Have we got any idea when the original texts were actually um, written? Yes, it, they're composites. So the, the bits that were written for adults, those come from the Greek world, and those are second and third century AD with additions going on up to the 4th and early 5th century AD. The bits that describe the children are all earlier. Um, I think they're 1st century BC, but it's very hard to pinpoint. For sure they are there by the 1st century AD, that's when, they're, that's when they're being taken over to the east, that's when the um, Greeks, Greek speakers are really starting to learn Latin in a major way, they're there by the 2nd century. But how much further back before that do they go? My theory is they probably go back quite a ways because we know that already from a very early stage of the Republic, the Romans are regularly learning Greek in school. And these are texts that were clearly designed for kind of regular school practice. You won't have had it immediately developing, but they have the whole hermeneumata, all the glossaries and stuff as well, they also seem to come from the Western school tradition. So I think sometime in the Republic, you get a bunch of teachers, probably Greek speakers, because those are the ones who are the teachers in the Greek teachers in the West, coming up with these texts and refining these texts. But it looks to me as though there's, they haven't divided enormously when they're in the West. The main division seems to happen after they go East. Um, and you know, I wonder, C Cicero and Atticus, they're in school together. Um, were they reading these? They could have been reading these. Is there a question? Yes, Alma, please. Do you want to know anything about um, changing pronunciation from transliteration? Oh, absolutely. So we have multiple transliterated hermeneumata texts. And the earliest ones are probably first century. So at that point, obviously, the w is not a, not a beta at all. That's an omicron upsilon. Um, and then as it goes on, it starts turning into a beta. So yes, that's, that's just one example. But absolutely, the transliteration helps tremendously with that. I'd just like to ask, um, this picture is full of schoolgirls. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and the, um, the texts, of course, are pueri. So Not girls. always, no. They are. Um, there's, there's one, Carlotta may remember it better than I do, but it's well, specific. The, the one where it's where it says, it's om, omnibus pueris et puellis, is that what it is? Yes. It's the Celtic Yes, the Celtic one, he says specifically in the preface that it's, this, it's necessary for all boys and girls, both the little ones and the bigger ones. So um, were, were uh, girls uh, given the same or roughly similar education as, as boys? Uh, we don't have a huge amount of information, and the, the character in, the main character in here is always male. I mean, most of the time you don't have a lot of gender, but where you, where you have an ending, he's male. Um, but you wouldn't have said necessary for all boys and girls if it were not the case that you could at least make a plausible case that all girls need to do that. So it sounds as though um, when it comes to language training, at least at a lower level, yes, the girls are getting the same stuff. Sorry, actually, could I just follow that up? The Celtics was the one with the, the interchange between the, the drunken husband and the... Yes. And the wife. Because, all, I mean, there's a sense in which, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's clearly a female role there that could mm. be performed. Yes. So you could be sort of learning how to berate your drunken husband as well as learning how to respond, what kind of excuses. Yeah. Very good. Thank you.
very important to that at primary school, that one. I was going to say, um, I mean, obviously these are very humorous, especially the way you presented them. I mean, do you think one can generalize from that about the nature of ancient education, or is it just the, the particular selling point? I don't think it's just me, no. I mean, for example, there's the one about how to visit a sick friend. So we're going to visit our friend, he's ill, and this is really the how to get around Rome. So you have, you're asking directions, and he lives in it, one of these multi-story apartment blocks. He's got a doorman at the base. You have to ask the doorman how to get there, and the doorman tells you how many flights of stairs and which door to knock on when you get to the landing. And that's what the writer is trying to tell you about, not about illness. And when you get there, you knock on the door, and the doorman opens it and says, oh, no, he's got better. He's gone for a walk. <laughs> I think that has to be deliberately humorous. There, there isn't any other option. One of the chaps voted to what we call a blue stocking now, who, having been taught by her tutors uh, the classics or something from it, she was then immediately expected to, ex to in order to memorise it and to understand what she'd learned, to explain it to her father. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, explaining it to your father, that would strike me as a better and fairer way than explaining it to the little kids, because your father probably knows whether you've got it right or not, and it's not going to be irrevocably damaged if you haven't. Whereas teaching the, it seems to me a little worrying for the, for the small children. But um, yes, that's very interesting. Thank you. I think actually, just following on from that, we've just cut adrift from that, but I think this was the system in huge numbers of rural schools in this country in the 19th century. Uh, it was quite normal that you would have uh, mixed ages uh, because the number of children in, in the village might be, you know, there are not that many that you can make separate classes. And it was normal uh, for the older children to be teaching the younger ones, and partly because one of the best ways of learning, at least, which has uh, seemed to me ever since I started teaching, is to teach it, <laughs> and then you realize how much you, you uh, still need to learn. But um, I think this was uh, very common, and probably not only in this country. Um, Certainly our, in the US, so that was, it was the normal system method. of, you know, it all being very categorized, and ages, and grades, and all the rest of it, is really quite recent. And there's no reason to think that, that I think that, that it was, uh, um, uh, you know, um, which other periods were more like today. Mm. Um, in fact, I mean, in, in the 16th century, there's loads of evidence. It's exactly like that. You would do your first bit of the BA course, and then you would survive by teaching uh, younger people while you went on to the second bit of the BA. Yes, well, we, um, you know, we do something quite similar now. The graduate students teach the undergraduates. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they're younger. I mean, yeah. In, yeah. Uh, in the 16th century, it would be kids of about 16, 17 who had been teaching the, the uh, 12, 13, 14 year olds. Mm. Is there any trace of this in any language other than that in Greek? I mean, I'm yes. thinking of Hebrew in, in the Middle East or, or Coptic, Egyptian in Egypt. Yes. Um, Coptic, that papyrus, this one. Um, that's actually got three languages. It's got Latin, Greek, and Coptic. Um, and I didn't mention the Coptic, but it's absolutely there. And therefore, we know that this is being used. It looks as though it's originally bilingual, and someone's translated the Greek into Coptic to make it possible to use this for a Coptic speaker to learn Latin. We know they translated the Greek, not the Latin, because it's corrupt. So the Greek and the Latin say different things, and the Coptic says what the what the Greek says. So Coptic, absolutely. Um, then in the Middle Ages, they kind of take on a life of their own, and people strip out the Greek and either use the Latin by itself or add another language in. So, and then they keep on changing it. So various things that are probably descended from these but don't really resemble them very much are found 
in all kinds of parts of the medieval West. Um, we've got, I think it's an Aramaic, I'm not 100% sure, I think it's an Aramaic version that is um, translated from, from these, but it's not quite, it's not quite the same. Um, Hebrew, I've got no evidence of, but very interestingly, Hebrew is the only language where I have evidence of this translation system being kind of re reinvented. And it looks as though in the early 20th century, someone in New York reinvented this, this narrow column translation system where every line lines up. Um, and it's thought that that was done particularly because you can't use it. Hebrew and English don't work for an interlinear translation because they're going in different directions. <laughs> and so this, this system is just really, really great if you have two languages that go in different directions. But as far as I can tell, that's a completely separate invention. And the person who did that um, had no knowledge that it had been used in antiquity. Well, I think perhaps at this point we should draw our formal proceedings of the evening to a close, but not before thanking Eleanor for a really fascinating glimpse of the <laughs>